Thanks for being here. Let's worship. Congregation, let's all stand together and sing our national anthem. <laughs> Oh 
was proved in liberating strife. For more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine. Still all success be no bonus, and every grain divine. America, America, God shed His grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood, from sea to shining sea, and crown thy good with brotherhood, from sea to shining sea. Even before we were a nation, God had plans for America. Because of God's plans, we have become the land of the free and the home of the brave. The Declaration of Independence says that the Creator has given us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And He has. He has given them through His Son, Jesus. Our forefathers said that we were designed to be one nation under God. But that can't happen just because it was their design. It happens when we follow Jesus. It happens when we humble ourselves and pray.
children. Praising the Lord. Amen. Let's give them another round of applause. Great job. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church, let's all stand together and we're going to sing the song, Blessed Assurance.
right, greet those around you in the name of the Lord. Continue our time together with At Calvary.
Folks, we live in a different world, don't we? It's not the same world that I grew up in. I thought these young people here this morning and uh, what they're facing, what the Supreme Court of this country did this week is an abomination of the Lord. But we know who's in charge, don't we? Amen. They made fun of the book. They don't believe it. But there'll be a payday someday. So we need to pray for our country. We need to pray for these young folks. That it'll change. It'll be turned around. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are heavy for our country today. I pray for it. I pray for people standing behind this desk to proclaim the unsearchable riches of God's word. I do thank you for our pastor who does a compromise Thank you for the opportunity to come today and again be able to sit under the word. Pray for each need here today. Probably as many needs as there are people. Yet we know we serve a great God. We want to bless you today. I thank you for the Lord Jesus for what he did for me. He paid a debt that he didn't know, Lord. I couldn't pay it. He loved me that much, and I'm so thankful. Pray for this service, that this word goes forth today, that it, it might touch hearts. Pray for the offering today, Lord. It's your word, your money. Lord, I pray to be used in a way that would honor our Savior, because it's for sure he deserves honor and praise. We bless your name today in Jesus' name. Amen.
the United States of America did not come into existence by coincidence. No nation exists by coincidence. And the reason I say that is because according to Scripture, God established all nations. By way of introduction this morning, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and I want to read a few verses here in Acts 17, and then we're going to our main text this morning, which will be Psalm 2. But we want to begin here in Acts chapter 17. Paul is at Athens, and here he's speaking to the Athenians, and as he does, he is sharing some very important information about who God is and what God has done, and I want you to listen at these verses. Beginning in verse 24, as he's speaking to the Athenians about God, he said, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood. Now listen to this. Focus with me now just for a moment on this verse. And he and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now when he refers to the one blood, I believe he's referring back to Adam, our forefather. And he says, from Adam has come the nations of the world. And notice what else he says here. He says, and hath made of one blood, that is from one man, all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Do you remember what God told Adam in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28? God created Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, and he blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And so God created man so that man would populate this globe, this earth. And in doing so, God himself is the one that established all the nations. Notice what he says. And he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. In other words, what, what Paul is saying here is, according to this verse, the sovereign God of the universe omnipotently decreed the history, that is the times, uh, and the boundaries, that is the exact places uh, for the nations, as he did the nation of Israel. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 32 and verse 8, it says, When the Most High divided the na to their nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. And one of the purposes in revealing himself in creation uh, and history is that people would seek him. Look at what he says back down in our text now in verse 37. He says, God hath put together from this one blood all these nations that dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and bounds of their habitation, that is, where they would, where they would exist, that they should seek the Lord and if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And so God says the whole purpose of revealing himself in creation and in history is that people would seek him. Uh, you can just write down this reference if you would like, Romans 1, verses 19 through 20. We won't go there and read. But I want you to notice that the nation, that according to the Scripture, that the nation that seeks God and honors Him as God will be blessed. For the Bible says in Psalm 33 and 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. However, I want to say this, my dear church family, that any nation that chooses to rebel against God and, listen, painful consequences are on the way. Did you hear me? Any nation that chooses God and honors God will be blessed of God. But any nation that chooses to rebel against God, there are painful consequences on the way. And I say to you today, 
as your pastor that in light of what I believe to be a very deliberate and calculated attempt of the political, some of the political leaders of our nation to take God out of this nation, America is soon going to experience the judgment of God. America will soon, somewhere, somehow, the United States of America, unless it turns to God, will suffer the consequences of its sin. America is sick. Did you hear me? America is sick. America is sin sick. It is infested with immorality. It has taken yet another step away from God. This past Friday, the ruling of the Supreme Court of the United States of America uh, to legalize same-sex marriage in all 50 states of this nation is just one indisputable demonstration of the shameless, disgraceful, and blatant disregard for God Almighty and His Word. Did you hear me? We're no longer the nation we once were. Socially, economically, militarily, and we're constantly going downhill. And this past Friday, the Supreme Court, passing the law that they passed, has made us just a little bit farther away from God's design for a nation. I want you to turn now, if you would please, to Psalm 2. And here's going to be, a, this will be our main text for today. You say, Pastor, how do you know that judgment is coming? All the nations in history that we know about who have done what the United States of America has done has suffered the judgment of God. And we are no exception. God will not allow our nation to get by with what it has done over the last years. We've allowed the Bible to be taken out of our schools. Now only students can pray in the school system. So many things have happened. Abortion on demand. Killing millions of babies a year in this nation. And the nation overlooks it and goes its way and accepts it as the norm. And now the Supreme Court has said, who, in my understanding, did not have the authority. The state should have the authority to determine what each state does. But the Supreme Court of the United States of America has passed this law now that says that it's all right for for same-sex marriage in the 50 states. It's okay. I told one of the deacons, some of the deacons this morning, I said, you know, the next thing will happen, it'll be all right to have sex out in the streets. It'll be all right to walk naked wherever you want to go. How much further will we go? How much worse can it get? Do you understand the implications? Do you understand the ramifications of what has just been done? Do you understand how I as a pastor will perhaps suffer as a result of this? Do you understand what will happen to us as a church? This is just the beginning. If something doesn't change and something doesn't happen, this is only the beginning. You better hear me today. I want you to see here something in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. It, it has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's some information here that we need to glean this morning. To sum it all up, the psalmist in the psalm here, David is exhorting the pagan nations. Listen to this now. David is exhorting the pagan nations to abandon their rebellious plans against the Lord and his anointed king who is none other than Jesus Christ and to submit to the authority of the Son of God whom God has ordained to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And here God speaks to the nations. And so today I want to share a simple message with you from this text in, listen, where we find that, listen, God is speaking to the nations, and so it, this is God's word to rebellious nations. And I want you to notice what he says. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Did you hear that? Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for my, thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled above, but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in the Lord. As we look at this passage together and we see God's word to the rebellious nations, I want you to see two things from the text. First of all, in verses 1 through 3, I want you to see the rebellion of the nations. I want us to look at the rebellion of the nations. And I want you to notice, first of all, their plan. That is the plan of the nations. Notice it in verses 1 and 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing. I want you to notice their plan. First of all, the Bible says in verse 1 that they rage. That is, they are uh, tumultuous. They, they cause a disturbance and they cause an uproar as a result of they seemingly being tied to God and tied to the Lord. The Bible says, secondly, they imagine a vain thing. They ponder and they meditate on a vain thing. That is something that is empty and worthless. And thirdly, it says the leaders of the nation set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. That means they set themselves against God and against his anointed king and son, none other than Jesus Christ. Now, historically speaking, his anointed refers to David and any of his descendants, but prophetically, uh, this, it refers to the Messiah, Jesus. And it says that they are willfully and continually standing against the Lord. Isn't that what's happening right here in our nation? The leaders of our nation, many of them are standing against the Lord, passing laws that are against God's word and against God's will for any, any people. But they are, listen, he says they are willfully and continually standing fast against the Lord and against the thing that the Lord has declared. Then notice next, the leaders of the nations take counsel together. The rulers sit down together to plot and plan how to break the nations away from God. Now notice, since we've looked at their plan, looked at their purpose, and that's stated in verse 3. It says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You know what they're saying? They're wanting to break the ties with God. They're wanting to burst the bonds. Figuratively, that means a restraint or a ban. They're wanting to remove every restraint that's out there. And isn't that what's happened? Uh, you know, that, that the leaders, some of the leaders of our nation are passing laws that will remove every restrainer there is in our nation when it comes to morality. That's exactly what's going on. Same thing that David wrote about that God is that God spoke through David that we're reading about. Mm. They break, listen at this, they break their bands to burst the bonds, figuratively a restraint or a band to remove every restraint there is. Secondly, to cast away their cords. And it's evident that these earthly kings that, uh, of these nations were taking a stand against the Lord. When they stood against the Lord, they were standing against Jesus, his anointed one. And it says in verse 3, listen, they wish to be free of whatever political control or social control that there was by the king and by God. And that's exactly what we have going on right here in our nation today. That is the rebellion of the nations. Now notice, if you would please, God's response to the nations in verses 4 through 12. Very quickly. God's response to the nations. Now I want you to hear this. Listen at the word of God. Folks, listen. I believe this is as relevant to our generation as it was to those to whom it was written back then. This is God's word to the to rebellious nations regardless of who they are or where they are on this earth. It is God's word to them. That means it's God's word to us as a nation. Now listen to this. Beginning in verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. 
The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. The Bible says that he, God, is sitting enthroned in the heavens and this refers to his his power, uh, where he is and, and, and how powerful God is. He is God and he's sitting enthroned in the heavens and he's going to laugh. He's going to laugh at the nations. Not only that, but God shall have them in derision. That means he will scoff at them. You say, why is that? Because according to verse one, their plans are vain. Look at it. He says, the heathens rage and the people, they imagine a vain thing. When a nation imagines and plots and plans and calculates as to how they can overthrow God and kick God out of their life and kick God out of a nation, I want to tell you, there are vain plans. You want to know why? Because those plans are destined to fail. You can't fight against God and win. A nation can't, doesn't have enough military might. A nation doesn't have enough money. A nation doesn't have enough anything to fight against holy God. God will win every time. God will win every time. The plans are vain. They're empty. They're worthless because they're destined to fail. Verse 5 says, God will speak unto the nations in wrath. Did you hear that? Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. You know, I'm afraid that this is the only remedy. This is the only way this nation will ever turn back to God. It is for God to pour out his wrath on this nation so that this nation can see that it is God fulfilling his promise and his word. People oftentimes will not turn to God and fall on their face and fall on their knees before holy God until they are, they are at rock bottom. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I know if this nation does not turn, this is going to happen. This nation is going to experience the wrath of God, and it can come in many different shapes, forms, and fashions. Do you know that Ron Paul, who served as a senator for many years, who is supposed to be... Uh, very knowledgeable of, of the financial status of our nation along with some other very influential uh, people in our nation. One particular man who was, who was um, called by the CIA and was involved with the CIA to, to fight against terrorism regarding the financial status of this nation. These two men are predicting that there is going to be a major, a major financial collapse in this nation by the end of this year. Now, whether or not that happens, I don't know. Time will tell. But I won't ask you a question this morning. If that does happen, what will you do? To whom will you go? Because you see, listen, my dear friends, our, our hope is not in a supreme court. It's in the supreme God of the universe. And we can't, listen, no, there's no telling what we are about to experience as a nation. We are being constantly threatened with terrorism. Our financial status is as on rock bottom. We owe trillions upon trillions of dollars of debt that we will never be able to repay. And when the other nations of this world decide that they're going to call on our debt, we're going to be in serious trouble. Do you understand that the, that the U.S. dollar means nothing in, in the rest of the world? There have several nations already stopped using our currency because it's worthless to them. And if the financial collapse does come, you know what? It won't matter how much money you've got. It won't matter how much money you've got in the bank because it'll be worthless. It won't be worth the paper it's written on. Folks, I'm telling you, we are living in a, in, a, in a very difficult, difficult day. And it is gradually getting worse by the day. If something doesn't change, if something doesn't change, this nation is going to experience things it has never experienced before. They are predicting that when this financial collapse takes place by, in September or after that, sometime at the last of this year, 
that it is going to last up to 25 years. It will be worse than the Great Depression was back in the 30s. It's going to be the worst depression this nation has ever, ever known. And not only that, but it's going to affect the whole world. Because you see, now we have a world economy. It's a global economy. But God says here, He will speak unto the nations through His wrath. Next, in verse 6, God declares his intention regarding the king. Look at what he says. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. He's referring to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe. Jesus, Christ. Listen, God has a plan for the world. It is a plan for good, not for calamity. But yet we as a nation and other nations have forsaken God and left him out of our life. And as a result, judgment will come unless something changes. God's king declares the Father's decree in verses seven through nine. The king says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Oh, the king declares the Father's decree. Number one, that he is a son. Number two, that the son can ask for his inheritance and the father will give it to him. And that the son will rule with authority and great power. It says that he will smash all those who rebel as he establishes his reign and he will put down all rebellion. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ will be ruler of this world. He's ruler now. He's Lord of everything. But there's going to come a day when Jesus Christ is coming back again. And my dear brethren, he is going to be on the throne. He is going to be ruling this nation. He is going to be ruling this world. Because the Father has given all power into his hands. Then finally, look if you would please as I wind this up, verse 10, verses 10 through 12. God warns the rebellious people. Listen to what he says. Be wise now. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, leaders of the nations of the world, leaders of the rebellious nations, O be wise now, ye kings, be instructed. I'm telling you, this is what you need to know, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in the Lord. He says, be wise and instructed. Serve the Lord with fear and honor the Son unless you offend Him and you perish. What is the conclusion of all of this? That we're in a serious state and something must change. And in my opinion, the only hope that we have is for the church of Jesus Christ to fall on its knees and pray. You know, I don't think we've really gotten serious about this matter. I really don't. I don't think the church of Jesus Christ has really gotten serious about what's going on in this nation. Matter of fact, let me say this. You may not like it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I believe the reason we are where we are now is because the church has not been praying. Because we will let this slide. We've just let it go and we've accepted it as part of our society and our world. But the only hope I believe that we have is that the church fall on its face and pray. We must intercede for America. If America is going to survive, we must intercede. And the journey back to God, to his forgiveness and his favor on this nation begins on our knees in humility and repentance and in prayer. Did you know that today, today there are, thousands, there are probably millions of Christians in America and churches in America just like our church that are falling on their knees today and praying for America? There's an emphasis going called call to fall. It is taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. We saw that verse on the screen when the children were doing their musical this morning. God is saying to the nation, if my people which are called in my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That is a call to God's people to fall on their face and pray. 
And today as we close this service, that's what I, the invitation is all about. I'm going to call you as members of this body to fall on your knees today and pray for this nation. I want us as a church body to fall on our face today before Holy God. You may be here this morning, you cannot physically get out on your knees, that's fine. But I want to ask you right where you are, if you want to come to this altar, if you want to get in the aisles, those of you in the balcony, you don't have to come down here. Just get on your knees somewhere in the aisle, in front of the pew where you are, somewhere. But I want us as a church to fall on our knees this morning and pray, pray, pray for our nation. Would you follow me right now? Let's go to God in prayer. Wherever you are, if you want to come to the altar, get in the aisles, wherever. Those of you that will and can and are able, please fall on your knees and let's pray to God right now for our nation. Everyone, please pray. I'm going to lead us in prayer, but I want all of you praying, praying for our nation, praying for our leaders, praying for the church of Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, I humbly plead for your undeserved mercy upon our lives today upon our church, upon our nation and world. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to come before you with a deep awareness that we deserve your judgment more than your blessing. By Jesus' blood alone, we, we plead for your merciful grace to revive and, and bless us once again as a nation. Oh, Father, we know that we're still blessed. We're blessed to be a part of this nation. I pray that you will help those of us that are here today to be aware of the fact that we as individuals are here because of you. We, we were born here. We were raised here in a nation that was founded upon the principles of the word of Almighty God. Oh, but Father, I pray that as we look at our nation and we look at ourselves, that you will send us an overwhelming conviction of sin and a deep brokenness and genuine repentance among us as your people. I pray that you will grant to us true godly sorrow that leads to true godly repentance and we will turn from our sin and turn to you, Father, as your word commands. I pray that you will fill us with holy fear and reverence for your name, that you will purify the church of Jesus Christ and prepare the church for your coming. Father, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. We don't know the day or the hour, but the signs, the signs indicate, as the world turns, the signs indicate that it can't be far away. Father, I also pray today that you will come upon all of your pastors in the United States of America, those who know you as personal Lord and Savior, I pray that you will come upon them with deep repentance and, and dynamic power and a renewed passion for yourself and for the word of Almighty God. I pray that you will grant to each pastor a mighty wall of protection from the world and from the flesh and from the devil. And Father, I, I pray today that you will grant each of us a burning hunger for yourself and a passion for, for fervent prayer. That you will help us to draw near to you and, and, and to seek you with all of our hearts, Lord, and cause us to hunger and to thirst for you above all else, else and help us, to Lord, to lead our churches and become houses of prayer for all nations. And Father, I pray you'll fill us with a burning passion to pray for and to witness to the lost. Cause our eyes to weep with tears for souls that we may reap in joy. And Father, I pray that you will empower your church and your people with a burning passion for local and global missions. Father, grant to us a, a fiery zeal for planting new churches. God, forgive us for our frequent lack of concern beyond what we desire. And Lord, fill us with your 
word and your will and cause us to desire what you want, not what we want. Oh, Father, I pray for the leaders of our nation that you will do a work in them. For those that are lost, that are, do not know Jesus, I pray they'll be saved. And I pray that when they're saved, that they will have a passion and a desire to follow you and to do what's right. And I pray, Father, for those who are in positions of authority and leadership that are not saved and, and will not give in to your Holy Spirit's dealing and wooing, that, Lord, you just remove them from office. And, God, that you would raise up godly men and godly women from the churches in this nation to take positions of leadership that will bring this nation back to you. Oh God, we're so sinful. Lord, I can only imagine even though you knew what was going to happen Friday before it ever happened, Lord, I can only imagine how it grieves your heart. As the Supreme Court passed this law, that same-sex couples can marry and live together and be legally married. That is against your word. It is against your will. It is ungodly. It is unnatural. Father, I pray that you will help us as Christian people not to hate those, not to, not to treat those who, are, who have that desire in any way other than through the love of Jesus. Help us to love them. Help us to realize that it's only by the grace of God that it's not some of us. My God, my God, I pray, please help us. Please help our nation. And Lord, I pray that if it takes your judgment, that when the judgment falls, that this nation will recognize it and they will hear you speaking loud and clear and it will turn this nation back to you and give those of us who know you grace and mercy and strength to rise above our circumstances regardless of how bad they may get and Lord, that you will help us to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for the blessings that you have bestowed upon this nation through the years and the way you continue to bless us. But, Lord, according to your word and according to what you have done to other nations, we're fearful. And that we know how powerful you are and we know what you can do if you so choose to do it. So Lord, be merciful to us. For it will rain on the just as well as the unjust. Be merciful to us and give us grace and strength and love and compassion. Thank you, Father, for every blessing. We commit this time to you now. And we join with millions of other believers in America as they're on their knees, some of them right now, praying, praying for our nation. Oh, Father, thank you so much for a church that believes in prayer. And may we continue to pray as individuals and as a corporate body for our nation and for one another and for the church of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for loving us. We bless you. We praise your holy, wonderful name. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you would, please be seated. We're going to close the service out in just a moment. But as was mentioned earlier this morning, we want to take our 4G offering. I'd ask our ushers if they would just begin past the plates. And uh, as soon as the offering is pa uh, taken, uh, then we'll close our service with another prayer. I want to encourage you to be here tonight. Um, 
I'm going to continue focusing on call to fall and we're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. I'm going to show a brief video tonight and uh, I want to ask you to please come and please be here for the service. And we, again, will have another prayer emphasis tonight. If you're here today and God somehow has spoken to your heart and he's drawing you and he's convicting you and you need to make some decision for Jesus, I want to just ask you to come to me. After the service, I'll be at the door. And uh, you just come to me and let me know uh, what God has said to you or how he's dealing with you. And I'll be glad to help you any way that I can. God bless all of you. I love you with all of my heart. I know that God has a plan for our nation. It is not a plan for calamity, but a plan for good. But my dear brethren, listen, we must, we must take this seriously. We must take God's word seriously and pray for our nation and pray for one another. Guys, come on. Y'all be taking the offering. God bless all of you.